right, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, get this opened up. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us on this glorious, very warm evening. Um, my name is Amali, and I'm the events director here at Books for Magic. So we are so excited to have John Cotter and Matthew Salisis with us tonight to celebrate the launch of John's debut memoir, Losing Music. Um, but uh, before we get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, mask wearing is optional, but encouraged at tonight's event. If you'd like an extra mask, we have some up at the front register where you checked in. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of tonight's discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, John will be signing and personalizing books at the table next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of Losing Music online using the link in the live stream description. All right, let's get into this. Um, Introducing this book is honestly no simple task. Losing Music recounts John's experiences as he learns to live with Meniere's disease, an incurable inner ear disorder. This book is at times devastating and unsettling and yet is still filled with so many little moments of joy, comfort, and compassion. There is truly so much to say about it, so I'll get off the stage quickly so John can do the rest of the talking tonight. John Cotter has contributed essays, theater pieces, and fiction to the New England Review, Georgia Review, Guernica, Electric Literature's Recommended Reading, Joyland, and elsewhere. He currently lives in Providence, Rhode Island. And as I mentioned earlier, Matthew Salisis joins John in conversation tonight. Matthew is the best-selling author of The Sense of Wonder, Craft in the Real World, Disappear, Doubled, Ganger, Disappear, and two other novels. He has written about adoption, race, and Asian American masculinity in the Best American Essays 2020, NPR's Code Switch, and The Guardian, among many other media outlets. Okay, that's all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in giving John and Matthew a very warm welcome. Thanks for coming. I'll start by reading a little bit of the book, uh, just to give you a sense of things. <clears throat> So Losing Music recounts my adventure with uh, an incurable, mysterious, disruptive <coughs> condition uh, that robs me of my hearing unpredictably, causes vertigo, took my life apart 10 years ago. In this portion of the book, I've moved uh, to Colorado with my wife, Elisa, and we're looking forward to a happier life. We're hoping the elevation has some benefit. I'm driving to, uh, I'm teaching four classes at five schools. I'm getting by as an adjunct. And this is a portion of the book where I'm driving to school. Uh, I'm having trouble with my hearing, but the vertigo, the sense of the room spinning to the right, to the right, picking up, turning to the right again, has been absent. It hasn't been around for months, and we think maybe it's gone. I'm clear of Denver by 7.35 and entering Golden. I can tell because the strip malls of Colfax disappear. A little southwest architecture has crept north this far. Pine portals adorned with the stubs of corbels above their doors, like placeholders for future balconies. They're supposed to look like this, the stage set of the Old West. When I first heard of the Colorado School of Mines, I pictured a mine shaft leading to classrooms, the dark of the rock, the white of the notebook, but it's beige brick and green sod. I park, cross campus, and arrive at my garden level seminar room and begin to write on the board as the students file in behind me. I write deontology, virtue ethics, consequentialism. In short, Kant's golden rule, Aristotle's good people do good things, and Bentham's averaging out. Mines hires English teachers to run their ethics class because it's also a composition class. 
in the course of teaching them how to write a college essay, I'm to introduce major ethical movements and pose a series of questions. What is the moral responsibility of an engineer? Does nature have intrinsic value, or must it yield to all human desires, no matter how unbridled? Do we frack first and ask questions later? Last Friday, I tried to do this through almost total deafness and a sound like an oncoming Amtrak in both ears. Now I can hear a lot better. Voices rise as the room fills, or at least they do when I turn my right ear to the room instead of my left. We were talking about that old property on Monday, I say, the old gas station. Your company's been hired to clean up. Your job is to test the ground contamination, and it's way too high here. Toxicity levels threaten a nearby water source, but your boss tells you to ignore it. You're raised one way, and then it's all over your face or all over your name. How much do we control what other people see in us? How much do we control what we see in ourselves? The honest thing is to go public with this information. People could be poisoned by this water, but it's going to set the project back, and it might endanger your job. Charles, what does Aristotle think you should do? I want to get through this part quickly, and Charles, ex-Navy, knows the answers. It's a cliche, but damn if military students aren't better prepared. Aristotle says you should behave virtuously, Charles reports, and honesty is a virtue. Right, but interestingly, loyalty isn't, and why would that be? Aristotle would approve of this style of teaching, dialogue. Out loud was how learning happened for the Greeks. As he wrote in his short treatise on nature, it is hearing that contributes most to the growth of the intelligence, for rational discourse is a cause of instruction in virtue of its being audible, which it is not directly but indirectly, since it is composed of words, and each word is a thought symbol. Accordingly, of persons destitute from birth, of either sense, the blind are more intelligent than the deaf and dumb. The Greek word for deafness was kophos, dull or blunt. I continue, whereas for Kant, what's the story? If we stay silent about the contamination, what are we saying with our silence? A crew-cut kid in the front puts his hand up. I feel guilty right away. He always tries to give me the answers, but he's so soft-spoken. I can rarely hear them. Today's different. I have a good strong left ear, so I nod. Go ahead. Kant is the categorical imperative? He's right. And he knows it, too. It's not a rare thing here at Mines. So by reporting the leak, I go on, according to Kant, everyone should report leaks all the time. And by not reporting it, we're making a universal law that nobody should. I hear a click when I swallow, like I'm changing altitudes. It's a symptom of the ringing getting worse. I know this but I try to tell myself otherwise. And utilitarians think what about the subject? Kofos, dull or blunt. Was that any less incriminating than the Oxford definitions of dizzy, foolish, or stupid, or giddy, mad, insane? Anybody? What do utilitarians think? The noise in my right ear hums louder now. Nobody remembers? I'm still writing on the board. I take a long time to form letters thanks to spelling trouble since I was a kid. It still comes up in stress. When I start to write a W on the board, it keeps turning out a Y. Emma, you must know this. What would the utilitarians make of the gas station problem? I turn around to find Emma laughing. A few of the kids around the table are smiling along with her. Her voice comes at me fainter than it should. I've said the answer like four times now. I'm a little deaf today, everybody, I shout. Uh, hooray, a shouting day. When I need their attention, I act like a goof. God bless Charles for nodding respectfully like I'm his commanding officer. Some of the others look confused. I haven't told them much about the ear thing. I've just asked what a lot. I have a whistle in my right ear. I say this loud. And until the doctors understand it can fix it, I need you guys to face me when you talk and enunciate big. Really use the diaphragm. We go on like that for a while but lots of them are shy and don't care for shouting. I've begun to suspect that some people really can't shout. By now they can tell I'm struggling. I'll switch gears. I'll involve them personally. So I ask a boy wearing sunglasses on my right what he would do under Kant's system of ethics, and I walk closer to him so I can catch the words. I wouldn't report it, he says. This is a more common answer than I'd expected, and I can't tell if the students would give it are serious. This particular boy is one I have an unhealthy prejudice against, perhaps because he looks exactly like a young Tom Clancy. 
I remind myself he's an engineering major. He understands how cross girders support cars on bridges, and I do not. <laughs> but then Kant's question is, what happens if people follow our example and nobody reports problems? Wouldn't dishonesty become endemic? Tom's talking, but it sounds like muttering. The noise in my right ear is a tea kettle now, and I could swear just moments ago the room jolted to the left. Or am I imagining that? What was that? You have to do what's best for your family, Tom says. Like if your job is to protect your family, that's your job. So you're do if you're doing your job, well, you're protecting them. You gotta keep your boss happy. I don't have enough money in the bank to quit my own jobs for any length of time or to lose them. Protect your family, I asked Tom. But you're not married yet, are you? Do you have a bunch of kids we don't know about? The class laughs, but Tom doesn't. Stupid thing to say. The noise in my right ear is a straight roar now, oscillating between the sound of a hairdryer on low and the sound of four hairdryers on high. The question is, what if your family drinks from the water source? Don't all families deserve clean water? Frustration spreads like a red stain across my cheek. The ancient Greeks tried to cure deafness with wool soaked in turpentine inserted into the ear. Immanuel Kant says you need to shout. I shout. Why are you whispering? There's little in ancient Greek literature about deafness. In Herodotus, King Croesus calls his deaf child wretched. You're not going to get another job if you ride on your bosses, Tom says. Keep the job you have. Homer was blind. He was not deaf. So I've come here today to learn the wisdom of how to write a memoir. <coughs> um, I suggest an MFA. Have you considered <laughs> getting an MFA? I, I got one a while ago in fiction, sadly. Has it expired? Is it still good? I'm pretty sure they only last for like 10 years. Yeah. You have to renew them, right? <laughs> Um, so that passage that you read, actually, I was wondering about that even I'm thinking about writing um, a memoir for people who don't really understand the experience that you are going through. And I kind of, when I was reading it, um, thought of that passage as a way that maybe you were trying to give people put people through the experience so that that would be a context for how they could read the rest of the memoir. Um, and I wonder what you, how much you thought about, right, like how to write um, in a way that's engaging readers who don't have the same um, touch points or like context for how to read the rest of the book. And, and when, you know, that's kind of part one. And then the part two is like, when do you decide to employ these things, right? So that's all like page 20 or something, right? So but, so by what, what do you mean exactly by the things you're talking about? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> mm. I guess I'm asking about how much you thought about an audience that, that. Um, oh, they wasn't listening to hearing, they wouldn't, wouldn't understand right. what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then where, where you thought to try to like use a scene like that to bring them along to mm -hmm. some kind of empathetic understanding. Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, I figured really early on in the book I would need to have a chapter that, you know, exa illustrated exactly what it was like, what I was going through. And so I thought, well, uh, can I maybe do it all in a story of one day? You know, just write a day of what my life was like. That was very, you know, as you, I'm sure a lot of people here know, if, if people have been adjuncting, it can be, particularly if you're adjuncting in a number of schools, it can be a very frenetic day, right? You start the day, you know, maybe grading or in the morning with whatever breakfast is that are being pulled together, and you jump in the car and you drive to some school, and then you, maybe, you jump on this, maybe you jump on the subway here in New York, right? It's a different culture than Colorado. <laughs> in Colorado, you get in a car, right? You drive along, and then you get up, you teach a class at that school, you jump back in the car, you drive to another school, 30 minutes away, 40 minutes away, teach a class there. Jump back in the car, drive to another school, half an hour away, 40 minutes away, teach a class there. And then you get to teach your night class, right? For your adult writing students in, in the evening, right? Not far from where you live. And then you can walk home. And that walk home is your time for you. That's your time for yourself that day. And so I thought, well, I'll take this little package and I'll, I'll talk about how, why it became hard for me with this condition. I'll try to do it with 
So there's all the stuff about the Greeks in that chapter because I was trying to use Aristotelian unity, right? I was trying to use the unity of time and place to talk about, you know, this one thing. So the portion I just heard you, I now I, then I go to this University of Colorado and the whistling gets worse. I have a vertigo attack, right? Um, I th so I, I guess the answer is I, I just tried to do it all early on. And, and, uh, and I try to, maybe not as much in the passage I read, I try to remember to give the reader treats. Uh, you know, I had a friend who, um, I said this uh, the other day in a podcast, I hadn't thought about it until I heard the words coming out of my mouth, but I had a friend who was reading Ulysses for the first time, maybe 25 years ago, and I thought I, I was too intimidated to do it. I said, I can't read Ulysses. And he said, no, no, you can do it, because Joyce gives you little treats. He said, you know, he'll make you work really hard for a few pages, but then he'll give you something really filthy, right? Or then he'll give you some really beautiful little piece of poetry. Um, or he'll say something very true. Uh, you know, and, and it'll be like, um, I was thinking about like in a dog show where they have, you know, when they have the dogs doing tricks and they have little fanny packs and they reach into the fanny packs and give them like a little, a little treat after they do the trick. Um, I try to think, I genuinely do try to think of writing like that. Like that the reader needs, the reader needs support and encouragement and, uh, and you, you know, they need to be challenged. That's part of the, it's one of the things they're going to you for is they're, they're there to be challenged. But, um, you know, uh, you need to hold their hands sometimes. What were the, the treats, you know, what kind of treats were you <clears throat> building in there? Every, every hundred books has a golden ticket. <laughs> inside cover. Uh, and it's, it's an invitation to get a sandwich with me. And, uh, uh, jokes, often. J say, on the same thing as Joyce, I've innovated nothing. You know, jokes, a little poetry. Um, dialogue is often a treat. It, having another character show up and having some real-time drama and interaction is a break from the headier stuff. It's a break from the ideas or the sort of internality, which can become punishing. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. There's uh, there's a quote early in the book about uh, trying to explain a dream. In the days, here's a quote, in the days that followed, I tried to explain to friends just how emotional it had been. You're describing kind of music experience, but it's like trying to tell a dream. Um, now I guess I, I think of that as a kind of interesting craft question. Like how do you, how do you write about this experience that nobody else can or very few of your readers are also experiencing, um, right? Like, how do you make that dream a reality? Um, and kind of as part of that, it made me wonder, you know, like, what's the what's the purpose of a memoir? Tell me, tell me why you write a memoir. Why why write a memoir in the first place? Um, and thinking about readers, right, who probably don't have Meniere's disease. What, what were you trying to do with the book to reach that audience? Well, only later did it become a formal problem. Did it become intellectually engaging? I mean, originally, I just felt really isolated by this thing that was happening to me. And so it was an act of communication. You know, I had to quit, um, I had to quit most of these adjuncting jobs that I was working. I mean, as, as, you, read, as you read in the book, you know, sometimes they, they it wasn't always my choice. I mean, I, you know, um, I had a, a, my boss at the University of Colorado said to me, you know, our, our preference would be that you resign. Um, I was having vertigo attacks all the time. You know, they, they've receded dramatically in recent years. I'm able to do a lot that I wasn't able to do back then. But at the time, I was really lonesome. And so I turned to to writing is one of the things I knew how to do. You know, if I was a painter, I'd paint, and I thought, well, I can, I can try to write, write down what's going on, and then hopefully someone else will read it. And it'll... the only agenda was an act of communication. It's the same reason you call a friend, but my hearing was too bad at the time to call a friend, so I wrote it down. And then, you know, later it became a formal problem. Later it became, you know, the artiste becomes engaged and it becomes an objet d'art, you know, but it, it, it was not the first impulse. Um, I was listening to this interview that you did on a podcast, um, and you were talking about how it was important, how important it was for you to feel, like, desperate to write the book. Um, and I guess 
you know, that's kind of like in the moment, I'm assuming you're feeling that desperation, that urgency. Looking back now, you know, what do you think you got out of writing the book that you can see from, from this side of it versus when you were in the process? I mean, I think it gave me a reason to live. You know, I think, uh, and a reason to live is different than a reason not to kill yourself, right? These are two separate things. So the reason not to kill yourself, well, the reason you shouldn't kill yourself, and I say this to all of you, I mean this very seriously, is because, you know, it accuses your loved ones, right? It makes it seem as though, it makes it seem as though they they couldn't do enough to stop you, etc. right? So this is why you want to, you know, not kill yourself. But that's not a reason to live. You know, a reason to live is something more profound. And uh, for me, the problem of how do I turn this into a book became an interesting problem. And it, that it became interesting enough that it got me out of bed. And it was <clears throat> con contrasted pretty dramatically with the novel I was working on before I started this. And when I first moved to Colorado, I was writing this novel that I, I'd write it here or there. I'd find a, I'd find a few hours at a, at a coffee shop and I'd get out my notebook and I'd make a few notes. I typed them up later on. I sort of pushed a scene around. Felt like I had all the time in the world. Didn't feel especially urgent. And I would read these things that all these great artists have said over time. You know, you must, you know, when Rilke talks to the young poet, and he says that you must want this one thing more than anything. You must abandon everything in order to get this one thing. That's not how I felt about the novel project at the time. You know, it felt like an interesting little artistic problem that was engaging me. Like you might paint watercolors on the weekend, you know? Uh, this book was an entirely different situation. This book became something that I was hoping, I really did think of it this way, and it, you know, that, that I would try to use the chapters one after the other. Um, well, now that Mr. Sachs has arrived, we can begin. Right? Can you start at the beginning? <laughs> we do intros again. So I thought I could use the chapters one after the other, right, as like, like you're climbing a ladder to kind of pull yourself back to life. And it worked. And you were writing them as essays at the time, right? So I was writing them as, although not all, about half the chapters in here originally were essays. And, and backstage, you were kind of telling me which ones had been essays. And I was kind of interested just to find that the ones, it, it wasn't exactly what I thought. Some were definitely the ones that I had thought. Um, but I actually felt, reading the book, that the first half seems more continuous, kind of tracking the story of how you, you know, kind of come into, um, a, you know, the diagnosis and then trying to figure out what to do about it and seeing multiple doctors and all of them kind of failing you and the healthcare system failing you and, you know, um, and struggling with that. Uh, and the second half, you, there, you know, like there's a, a chapter about Jonathan Swift and there's a chapter where you go to the shelter. And so there are these individual, it's felt more like essays in the second half. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, you know, how much of that was intentional and how, and also like how, to, tell me how to turn the essays into a memoir. <laughs> Yeah, well, the first half poses the problem, and then uh, and and we couldn't solve it the way that we wanted to solve it, right? The first half is is what would have been the whole memoir if we found a cure, you know? What I really wanted to find was a cure for this condition. We never did find a cure. So then the second half is more picaresque, because I become this Picaro, who's going through the world looking for. Uh, reasons to reattach myself to the world, looking for ways to live with this thing that has happened to me. And we also have to deal with this element of time because the really acute part of this condition, you know, sort of hitting me in my search for a cure, this all took place over the course of about a year or two. But learning to live with it takes longer. Learning to live with it and to live a fulfill fulfilling and satisfying life, uh, it takes years and it's attrition. And so, the second half becomes more episodic, partially because it's covering a longer period of time. So, you know, it's funny, some of those those chapters that may read like essays, you know, like maybe, I don't know, like the bit where I go to Boston, is that one of them? Mm -hmm. uh, 
I'd return to a city where I used to live, but I was a very different person. In fact, I was the person I'd been afraid I would become, that I was afraid I would turn into, right? Because, you know, we all have these people, we have the person who's walking, t you know, 10 feet ahead of us, who is us in two weeks or two months or two years, if things go pretty good, you know? They've started working out again. Uh, they're eating right, you know? They're, uh, they're uh, reconnecting with the relationships in their life. They've finished this big project that, ugh, this big project has been tearing them a new asshole, right? They've finished it, it's done. Uh, they're able to just like live life again. They're going out to see shows again. They haven't seen shows in years. Why did they ever stop, right? And they're saving a little bit of money. And in fact, things are going a little bit better at work, right? And they, maybe that new house is a little bit in range. Maybe let's, you know, maybe we can finally buy a pony, you know? Uh, this, is, this is this person who we're racing to catch, right? And then there's the person who's racing to catch us, whose footsteps we hear, right? Click, click, click behind us when we turn corners. And that's the person who is uh, not only are they not working out, remember that little spot that we wanted to get checked out? Bad news about that little spot, right? It's that person who is not reconnecting with their relationships, they're just, they, they're letting them fall apart. Their friends are writing and saying, hey, I thought we were friends, what's going on? And it's not, no, nothing's going on. Um, the person who is work has got a hold of them, and in fact, maybe there's serious problems. It's this person who looks haggard and ravaged. <laughs> by this thing that's happening to them, this life that's happening to them, right? And, um, why did I start talking about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> are you gonna tell us how to turn the essays into a memoir? <laughs> so the story of going to Boston, for me, I remembered on my own. The story, the story, the story of going to Boston, for me, was the story of, uh, that guy behind me catches me. And then I return to the city where I used to live and I see all these people who used to know me as the older version of me. And uh, this settles me in the way a house has to settle into the ground. And uh, it wasn't originally an essay. It was just something that I thought I ought to put in the book. But you know, I think by the time I got there, so many of the chapters had been essays that I felt like the chapters had a, a certain integrity. You know, they often were time, one time in one place. So I just, that was the rule. So I just kept following the procedure. Yeah, yeah. The, that moment in, in Boston, um, on the same podcast you're talking about, I, there's this really lovely metaphor about um, how you had felt like you were, the movers had come and taken away all the boxes of the life that you had expected to have. Um, and so you, instead of having, or even knowing, um, playing with or against whatever your expectations were, all of those things were just taken away and you had nothing, like you had nothing that you could have ever expected. Um, and you had to live in this place with none of your stuff, right? Uh, and I've been, uh, I, there's a way in which you can read the book actually is this kind of like, movement of a of a like a white cisgender male straight male um who believes in a kind of like agency pull you up to, you know there's a kind of american like individualism um having to kind of face the fact that like what's going to make or break every single day every single moment for you mm -hmm. is completely out of your control right and and having to come to this place where um all of the boxes that were full of like the things that we think we can do for ourselves, the people we think we can make for ourselves are now gone. And you have to kind of deal with whatever the world is going to throw at you. Um, and, and because my brain is weird, I started thinking about climate change um, and how we're moving into a time or already kind of living in a time in which the future is something we don't know what to expect of, right? And that's kind of actually, at least as part of this, like, yeah. the, you know, one of the things um, is, right, like we can't really even imagine what it is and it's too big for us to imagine anyway. Um, and I, I've been thinking about these kinds of books where, you know, they're preparing us. And, and I felt like your book was doing this maybe, kind of preparing us for this moment in which the movers come and we have, we're facing a world that we don't understand or, or have never even been able to anticipate. 
Um, and, and can you talk about, you know, how you've been able to live in that space, adapt to something completely new, um, you know, what writing has done in that space? Yeah, it's a struggle, I think, to live in that space. And I think also it, it comes with the realization. I mean, yeah, I, I think your reading is, is accurate, you know. Um, and there's other readings too, right? One of, well, one of them is that, or just to expand on that, is that it turns out that this guy who thought he had agency never really did to begin with, right? right? Uh, it's a struggle all the time to try to make our peace with this idea that we're not really in charge of our own lives. Because we always, we have to believe that we are. You know, we go around, even if we're not deliberately telling ourselves this story, we're maybe unconsciously telling ourselves this story, you know? And now I'm going to do this, and then this is going to happen, and now I'm going to do that, and this is going to happen, and a week from now this will happen, and a month from now this will happen, you know? And uh, we really struggle. And I think each individual, for me at least, it hasn't evolved into a holistic philosophy, aside from what's in the book, aside from, you know... Um, we have to try to make the choice to. We have to try to make the choice to accept the things that come to us, because there's no alternative. Do you think the memoir puts like a false arc on that? And that right, like you you were talking earlier at dinner about um, one of the things trying to you're trying to do when turning it into a memoir is like to identify a larger arc because mm -hmm. memoir has to have an arc. Um, and this kind of, the ways that we expect stories to give us a certain, like to create expectations and then fulfill them or like blatantly unfulfill them. Um, you know, lining that up, that kind of like determinedness, determinedness mm -hmm. with uh, the kind of uncertainty of what you're actually facing. Do you, did you feel that tension there between the project yeah. and... Yeah, it's very difficult. Yeah, uh, we, you know, I, I didn't want to tell the story of, you know... I mean, memoirs have a certain... I mean, it's 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 the, the inspirational books are in a, a, a adjacent shelf, right? So many memoirs that we read are about celebrities, and they're doing great. <laughs> and, and, and they're just like us, John. <laughs> I see that more and more every day. Um, there's, there, there, you know, a, a lot of them started in humble places. They had struggles, you know, and now they're they're doing great. Uh, and so I think the the form of the memoir is always trying to push us toward. And here's what I learned that I can give to you, right? And and always trying to push us toward. Thank heaven this all happened because I'm in the place that I am now. Or thank heaven it made me the person I am, the strong person I am, is able to bear this thing that I can bear now. I was very adamant that I didn't want this book to become, thank God I got sick, right? Because here's all the lessons. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to write the book that said, and here's the one weird trick that I used to become cured, and you can use it too. Which meant that it had, but there's always arcs. <laughs> There's always an arc. It just might not be one we're aware of. You know, uh, when a cat looks at things, the cat just says, is it a mouse, is it a bird? Is it a mouse, is it a bird? You know, it's looking at you and it's like, is it a mouse or is it a bird? Right? And it just still doesn't know. It's just why it stares at you the way it does. It just doesn't know, you know? Uh, and that's really all it cares about. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't think to itself, you know, uh, Oh, you know, uh, looking at the shelf over here. Oh, Willard Spiegelman has written a, a book about Amy Clampett. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if he'll give her later work as much prominence as he as her earlier work. You know, uh, because her juvenilia is interesting in a different way than this when she started publishing with the New Yorker, etc. Right? Cats don't give a shit about that. Well, in the same way, in the same way, when we're, you know, we need to try to find a different arc than maybe the one that we're fixated on the one we're focused on, you know? And for me, uh, the arc of the book is related to losing my hearing, but the book that I set out to write, the, the book that I finished writing, I don't think really is a book about 
primarily about hearing loss, you know, or, or about chronic illness. I think, hopefully, it's a book about living at the whim of chance, living in the lap of luck, good luck and bad luck. And it's about living with loss and orienting ourselves toward that loss, which is a bit of a broader subject. So I'm just going to put on the radar that I think we should start thinking about questions. Um, and I'm going to, in that period of time, I'm going to ask you, John, if you could uh, elaborate on um, uh, maybe one or two quotes in here that I, I liked. And sure. I have a question for you when it's when we're, you know, before we go to the audience. Okay. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think that's how this works. <laughs> Um, so I was thinking about this at dinner too, because of the way, where the, uh, anyway, the quote is, even if our tastes begin as a pretense, they soon become who we really are. And one of the great lessons I learned was to periodically try to disrupt that ossification. Just kind of expand on that, because people probably haven't read the book yet. Oh, sure. Well, uh... I mean, that was originally in the context of music. You know, I used to go to the, uh, I, I wasn't someone who had like taste in music that people, you know, that anybody really admired. But what, <laughs> what I tried to do, but sometimes you start in a, in a place like that and then you, it gives you permission to explore, you know, because I never had, right, like good taste in music. I could have any taste I wanted. It didn't have to stay. I didn't have to follow what everybody, you know. So I would go to the library and I would just get handfuls of CDs. Um, does everyone here know what a CD was? <laughs> It's, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a disc that you put down, you put a needle on it. I, 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 would, I had these handfuls of CDs that I would come home with, and I would just listen to, I would just grab a handful of opera CDs. I was listening to ten operas at random, or, you know, I'd listen to a bunch of old Torch songs, a bunch of Duke Ellington, you know, early jazz, or I would listen to, uh, you know, ambient music or whatever. I would just grab these big, um, big handfuls of things, uh, and it showed me so much. <laughs> I mean, I think this is so important. You know, uh, so I, I try to, you know, we all know people who their their development and their taste stopped at about age 22. But then Instagram tells them what they what they like, right? What's that? But then Instagram tells them what they like. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's weird. You're talking, about, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. talking about that at dinner, right? How Instagram is trying to figure out what you like so it can just give you more of what you like. And then you never have to go anywhere else, right? We're surrounded by these things that are keep trying to figure out these algorithms, trying to figure out what we're liking. And uh, well, maybe that's it. maybe that's why you asked. That's an interesting point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. It's a it's a way to disrupt. <laughs> Randomness, chance, luck is a way to disrupt this this thing as well, right? Luck can be on our side too. Luck can be good luck. It doesn't just hand us misfortune if we're able to steer it. Yeah. Anybody ready to ask a question? I. But, but, oh, 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 yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, was any of this helpful in learning how to write a memoir? <laughs> I, everything's helpful in learning how to write, I think. <laughs> Very diplomatic answer. <laughs> it's like a United Nations speech. <laughs> if not, there's this, there's this point on, on page 233 where you say there's one of these two answers is true, but you don't know which, and I wonder if you know now. It's, um, one is, the, so your, your friend is asking you like what you've done that makes you seem like you've kind of been able to come to some sort of acceptance, or at least look like you've come to some sort of acceptance. And at first you say, I've learned how to put on a better act. And then you say, that's not true, forget that I said that. I think the answer is, I'm gradually forgetting how to be the person I used to be. I can't separate me from it anymore. Maybe that makes it easier? One of these answers is probably true, but I don't know which. What do you think now? I've learned to forget. Uh, I've learned to, to not ask the question. <laughs> I've learned to not ask why I seem to be getting around better. Um, I've learned to just trust in it. Um, it's a little bit of both. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot of wisdom in this book. Questions? Yeah, great. So, I know that you sort of already talked, you talked about Ulysses, and I'm afraid that, and you also talked about celebrity memoirs, and so I, I kind of know that the answer to a question about what memoirs sort of either intruded upon you or were there as maybe perhaps even powerful models for you might just be an answer like, yeah, nothing, because maybe those weren't important to you at all. But I, so I would, I'm, 
I would put the question, either pick up that, or if you like, were there, were there texts that you were struggling with as you, as you went, went, went through this? Things that were kind of problematic alternative paths? You know, I'm just, I guess what I'm just asking is more generally, what was the literary dimension of your experience going into this? Were you looking at certain writers, books that were haunting you in any way, or were you just like, were you coming to those later after you sort of started down the path? I mean, the really politic answer is to name a bunch of, you know, contemporary fashionable memoir writers. Well, that was and say, what I was you know, you would do with <laughs> what, what did he just say? Was the... He said that was what he was hoping for. Yeah, I, I was, it's not the answer. It, it was very granular. I think probably most of the things that were influential in writing the book were things I'd read 10 or 20 years earlier and that had just got really ground up real fine. You know, I think I'm, I'm someone who was fortunate enough that I have been involved in a lot of different literary enterprises of one kind or another. I mean, I was doing slam poetry for a number of years, and, and after that I ran an arts review site and I wrote a bunch of book reviews, and you know, years after that I tried to write a bunch of short stories that were all really bad, and then time went by and I didn't really study the form, I didn't really think about it very much, and then I tried to write a bunch of short stories and they were better. Um, all of a sudden. And I, I, think, uh, I think it just, I've been exposed to all these different um, ways of telling stories and ways of manipulating language and ways of handling thought. And I think that when I sat down to work, they gave me a hundred small ways to solve a hundred small problems. Uh, I, I really do think it was a book that, there wasn't an immediate model uh, for what I was doing. It, it was, um, Took 20 years. Sir. This was discussed when I, before I got here. I, I apologize. Uh, you, the, the, to me, one of the most powerful parts of the book is you're, you're, you're writing about your experiences with hospitals and with doctors and how you went to them sort of expecting that they would have some sort of miracle cure that they would offer you. And then the book is a discovery that they don't even know what they're talking about happening there. But presumably, you still have experiences with doctors, if, with the medical establishment. That's not finished now, even if you're at a different place psychologically. We all go to doctors, and we all sort of have a lesser experience of that kind, though. We have something wrong with us. We expect them to fix it to some extent. How do you... You're still going to doctors, I assume. You're still dealing with this this ailment, what is the attitude that you take to it now, or how, is, how has that changed? Are, you st are they still trying to understand it, or is that done now, or are you still reading about this sort of thing? Is that done? Is well, I understand what they're doing better uh -huh. when I go on to see them. You know, I, I know how it works. You know, they're, uh, they're doing differential diagnosis. They're trying to uncheck boxes. They're trying to figure out, okay, well, it's not, it's probably one of these 10 things Let's see, uh, that eliminates half of them, this eliminates half of them. But then when you get them to that difficult place where they don't have answers, I, I mean, I can spot right away when they get worried. You know, and I, I, I have a lot of respect for the profession in the sense that I think most people who go into it really want to help people. And I think that there are a lot of conditions for which they're able to put those tools to use and they really are able to help people. And I think they save lives. I think um, they're human beings, and just like every human being, some people are, are very conscientious and dutiful, some people are lazy, some people are having good days and bad days, some people have a meeting scheduled, you know, five minutes before you walk into their consulting room and they want to get you out within five minutes, you know. Uh, I, think, I think it's still a fraught relationship, you know. John, I remember that I was supposed to ask this question. Um, my partner is a poet, and, and um, she wanted to know, and I think it's a, an interesting question, L did losing music change your relationship with the music of your sentences? They're all I have. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, yeah, it, it, it deepens my relationship with poetry. 
did it change like the your the the rhythm that you have in your head for your sentences at all? Did, like, do the sentences come out differently? Do you think? I don't know. I don't know. I almost feel like I, I wouldn't. If I thought I knew the answer, I might be wrong. Um, I think I'm a better writer than I was. I think uh, I probably said this on that podcast you heard. Once you told me to listen to the podcast, I thought, shit, I can't use any of the podcast material. <laughs> That's why I said that. What's that? That's why I said that. Yeah, I mean, I, I articulated it so well on that podcast. <laughs> Boy, that's, I refer you all to it. You know? I really think that's what you should do. Um, that's the real job. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the carbon copy. Um, you know, I, I, I keep saying this quote when I talk about the book and uh, I don't know it was a jazz musician who said it and I don't remember which jazz musician it was it might have been Chet Baker I don't know uh, he said if you are a trumpet player and you don't play the trumpet for a year you become a better trumpet player right this sounds very counterintuitive this is not probably good advice for living <laughs> not, not not good advice for doing like microscopic surgery or for, or for like driving right but uh in in my life it is often proved to be true and uh i think i have been artistically not doing anything very interesting for a few years before this i wrote this book and i think i'd also been through personally through this very harrowing experience and i didn't have any expectation when i sat down that i would be better at writing a book but I was and uh, I think I I made a real effort the nonfiction form challenged me because I, I made a real effort to get better at looking and describing to do this thing that they taught me in art class when I went to art class uh, like I took a summer art class at, at this school that would eventually become my high school in the Cranston Art Building I took this, this summer art class where they, they, they were trying to teach kids how to draw, right? It was a way to just, some place to stick the kids so the parents could go and do, you know, whatever they were going to do. And I, uh, they would put something on the table, a leaf or a little model, and they would say, really look at what you see. Really look at it and draw what you see. And of course, you never do that, right? You draw instead uh, your image of the thing or what it's supposed to look like, or that's why kids draw houses the way they look, right? They don't, you know, draw the way they look the way they look. And you have muscle memory if you've drawn things before and you have ideology, right? That causes you to draw things a certain way and you have desires. You wish the thing looked different than it did, right? And you have fears and you have to try to look past all those things and really see what the thing is. And I think when I was writing fiction prior to this, I, my imagination was too easy. And I think something about the memoir form forced me to say, well, no, you have to tell the truth now. You have to be really honest. So you have to really look at this thing. What is it? And give sustained attention, not just to the situations and the people around me, but to the situations in the past as well. And say, no, that's not what it was like. What was it like? And then you might remember it differently. Okay, you can tell both those stories, but separate those stories. And uh, I think that probably happened at the level of language too. I probably got better at writing sciences. Like you mentioned a couple times that uh, you're at a different place with your condition right now than you were when you were an adjunct professor in Colorado. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to write about your own experience and uh, kind of what you're going through while you're going through it versus when you feel like you're at a different place than at the crux of it? Mm -hmm. It's easier to do it while you're going through it to some extent because you have immediate access to it. I mean, I think about, you know, the chapter in this book about Fort Lyon, I uh, just wrote it down while it was happening. <laughs> it was so easy. I would just go and have a conversation with someone, and then as soon as it would be finished, I'd be like, okay, just hold that thought, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> and I would go in the other room, and I would just write it all down. Um, and that doesn't necessarily get you any closer to the meaning of what happened, but that's, you know, it's much trickier if you're trying to remember, okay, we were, it was this play rehearsal that I was at five years ago, oh Christ, what do we talk about around the table? You know, then you have to actually do legwork. You have to be a journalist. You have to interview the people who were there. You have to sort of put it together. In terms of the meaning of it, I think it's difficult. I think we don't, we don't feel emotion as articulate often 
you should generally don't feel pain as articulate, right? You know, Elaine Scarry has that line. She's like, pain is the thing that cannot be communicated. Like anything can be communicated except for pain. And uh, your pain is your own. <laughs> and I remember when I did a first draft of this, I gave it to my friend Tim in Colorado. And he said, uh, this is real raw, man. I mean, this is raw. I mean, you are in pain. I don't think you should edit this. But I also don't think you can publish it like this. <laughs> right? It's a different kind of artifact. You know, you're making a different kind of artifact if you're writing this this raw sort of emotion than if you're sort of trying to articulate it, you know, in the King's English. Um, you're trying to, to put it into a story that that, that they can put it a teal cover on and, and get a way to put the word joy on the cover. Uh, it's a different experience. So I think one more? Oh, two more, okay. So, hi. So I've, I've been thinking about wondering what you've learned about the fragility of language through the experience of the fragility of her own hearing. And as someone who makes these remarkable I mean, I experience it, it's not just the fragility of language, but the fragility of everything. I mean, everything seems so much... Um, you put it beautifully in that essay you wrote one time. You said it's a moment. You remember that line? You said that's, you said that's what separates life and death, is a moment. You know? And I... I that's true. <laughs> you know? Uh, everything is, is so much more fragile. <laughs> than I would have assumed. Um, and I think, I'm a little less careless with language than I was. I really try to get it right. And I also understand that there's several different ways, there's several different things one could mean by getting it right. And I try to differentiate between those things. So one way of getting it right is to be objective. Another way of getting it right is to be truthful to how you felt. Another way to get it right is to describe something with the most generosity of opening it to different interpretations by different people. Another way of getting it right is to close it off to other interpretations, like in legal language. Um, But I also am just very much in love with language, you know, because um, this is so beautiful and you can make so many you can tell any story and uh, I'm anxious to tell more stories it's this thing that I there's so many things that I can't do now that this one thing becomes, it assumes more space in my mind. And I'm excited to, I'm excited to see what I can do. I'm excited to see what other stories I can tell. It's probably a good place to leave it, right? It's not gonna get better than that. <laughs> for coming out tonight. Thank you, John, for celebrating this fantastic launch with us. And thank you, Matthew, for moderating such a wonderful conversation. As I said earlier, John is going to be signing and personalizing books at the little alcove next to where you checked in. My coworker, Jules, is gesturing right now to where that is. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit hidden right now, but we're going to ask that you all kind of line up down the center aisle and curve around. And please make sure to grab your personal belongings so that we can start to break down chairs and rearrange our space.
Again, we have additional copies of Losing Music available for purchase at the desk where you checked in, as well as Matt's most recent novel, The, the Sense of Wonder. Um, okay, that's all. Let's give these two one more round of applause. Can I, I, you can turn that off.